so welcome everybody to the WSU Disaster Resilience Analytics Center seminar series. And our speaker today is Dr. Alison Specht. Uh, she is an environmental scientist uh, with broad expertise in research, teaching, and community engagement. And in the past 10 years, she has focused on facilitating interdisciplinary groups to tackle complex environmental problems using existing data. Her major interest, apart from her domain's activities, are to enhance collaboration between scientists, policymakers, and managers to improve environmental outcomes and improve data management and preservation, data sharing, and reuse. So, Dr. Speck, thank, thank you, you very for being much. Here. Thank you very much, Atri. I will make sure I share the screen. Um, and of course now, I, yes, there we are, um, appropriately. And hopefully you can all see and hear me, which will be great. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk to, to you this morning or <laughs> in my time, or at least today, your time, and about some, some of the work that I've been doing over the last few years namely helping multifaceted teams achieve open science outcomes. Um, and today I'm, I'm speaking from a, a basis of numbers of things, particularly a project funded by the Belmont Forum, uh, the Parsec project, uh, which is about uh, protected area detection using satellite image, image analysis and um, using machine learning. Uh, and looking at the effect of the creation of those so protected areas on the socioeconomic status of the local communities. So you can see there's a little bit of overlap with, with your DRAC. Um, I presently come from uh, the University of Queensland via a national ecosystem research e-infrastructure, the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network. So enough of an introduction. Um, I'm going to talk today in about four things, or at least I committed myself to do that. Um, namely, first, the elements for successful collaboration, finding data and code fit for use, access the tools you need, and open science practice and outcomes. But before I start, I'd like to make sure we have some scene setting. Um, we start in and a lot of the motivation for this sort of movement, as you will know, is these complex environmental challenges that we have facing, have had facing us over the last 20 years, but more than that, but certainly global challenges that we've begun to recognize require a global response, namely things like global warning, disaster, disaster um, uh, challenges, um, ocean acidification and so on. And but accompanying that, and this is the trick, which is what I'm going to be um, focusing on today, is are uh, the challenges of big data. Um, and that we apparently have a plethora of data and it's going to disappear. And we require ever urgent solutions to these, um, to these big things. And of course, this is where the e-infrastructure steps in, such as turn, um, neon, and so on. The other, so this elicited a response way back in 1998 by Edward Wilson, who has just died. He was a, a global leader in ecology. And back in 1998, he recognized that we were drowning in information way before the, the word data deluge was coined and that the world henceforth will be run by synthesizers, people able to put together the right information at the right time, think critically about it and make important choices wisely. Um, he wasn't really thinking then about this urgent solution exercise, but obviously the, the, the emphasis and the drive to look at how we can harness existing information uh, better, both um, to, to make such decisions to help make important choices has really grown since 1998. And I've run over the past 10 years, two synthesis centers. Um, there are particular centers called that 
uh, one in Australia, one in France. And, of course, this was our best quote that, uh, that supported our raison d'etre. The other thing that's just come up recently is the UNESCO Open Science Recommendations. So in the last just few years, this term open science has been increasingly coined. And UNESCO just last year uh, released a document, and I've put a little bitly at the bottom there that you can look at uh, at your leisure. Um, and the three aims that uh, ring true <clears throat> are to, and that I will use today, <clears throat> excuse me, is to make multilingual scientific knowledge openly available, accessible, and reusable, to increase scientific collaborations and sharing for the benefit of science and society, and to open the processes of scientific knowledge creation, evaluation, communication to societal actors beyond the traditional scientific community namely that transdisciplinary goal that many of us have been talking about for quite a few years, not necessarily correctly. Um, the values, and I've, this is another slide from their report, uh, the values of engaging in open science include making sure that the information that is available is of quality and integrity, that by engaging in open science, you're allowing everyone to benefit from the work that's done throughout the globe, if possible. That by exposing such work uh, and data and information as widely as possible, equity and fairness will be uh, much more able to be achieved. And of course, the same thing goes for diversity and inclusiveness. I'm not going to, to talk much about the principles because they're much more uh, political in uh, my opinion. And we can look at that later. Hopefully we achieve all these things. So today, uh, the first section, and I'm mindful of the fact that uh, my colleague, close colleague, Kevin Crouston, <clears throat> excuse me, it's very early in the morning, gave you a talk sometime last year, was it the year before? Uh, about our work in progress. And that is, uh, I'm building on that to give you a bit of an update of the elements for successful collaboration, together with some personal experience of my running synthesis centres and research groups. Finding data and code fit for use, of course, we'll, we'll, I'll join that with accessing the tools you need. But first, <clears throat> purposeful collaboration. Okay. Um, we took a long time to get this, I took a long time to get this diagram encapsulated as it is very difficult to convey uh, some of the conceptual information uh, that one wants to about a process uh, that one's trying to achieve. So hopefully this does it. Um, basically, the sorts of challenges that we've got today are transdisciplinary, supranational cross-organizational. You can think COVID, of course, you can think Zika virus, any of those zoonotic viruses. And of course, we've just thought of the, um, climate, the climatic and geological challenges that we have uh, and geomorphological challenges that we have all around us throughout the world. And for that, this multi-scale analysis and synthesis of existing data is required. And so what we want to do is we want to gather experts together and they have to be discipline specialists because this is transdisciplinary, even discipline specialists in the street politics, if you like. They're usually time poor. In other words, uh, they've got their own jobs. And in order to solve some of these transdisciplinary, supranational and cross-organisational problems, they have to take time out to, um, to, to work on this together. So time poor is a very important factor in gathering this sort of research team together. Many of these experts will be data novices. Now we're talking, I'll talk a lot more about data science and what is involved with that. Um, but if you're involved in being a good discipline specialist in X, Y, or Z, you're probably not going to be ragingly good at, at being a data specialist. It's, it's another specialty in many ways, but everyone in order to engage in open science, need to have some sort of knowledge or assistance to be a data specialist. 
they're often isolated in the classical ivory tower and very particularly um, working against the need to get together to talk about and to deal with some of the, and work on some of these big um, transdisciplinary and supranational problems is the, um, the progression and the emphasis on individual success for things like promotion and so on. So intellectual property or IP is often the primary concern of many of the experts, if not presently, as in a mature expert, but also, uh, but certainly when you're young, you risk ignoring your intellect, your um, quality performance, individual quality performance at your, at, at your risk. Data, of course, comes from very many different sources. It's not always the same. Uh, different methods are used. Quality assurance is different. Time frames are different. Scales. Owners might be quite important. You might have some data that you really need that is owned and covered by some sort of covenant. And, of course, levels of description, so you don't always know. So I'll be touching on that in the second and third part of the talk. And, of course, what we do is we hope that by putting these teams together, such as yourselves, um, you'll all get wonderful insights, you'll gain a great deal of wisdom, great probity will be, you know, you'll be the, the team to watch, and you will have data for the future, which is very important because unless you have data availability, the next generation, the next challenge won't have the data to play with. So these are, uh, this was my conceptual description of what we're trying to do. So here we are, we're working together. And my little laptop there in the middle of my image keeps on moving. So at the moment, it's sitting on a, a rich text image of this complex uh, group that you might have gathered together. You'll have different organisational types represented as relevant to one a particular problem. Discipline types are obvious uh, for most of these modern, global, challenging problems. Of course, uh, species, for example, and my background is in environmental science, so species come to the fore, are no respecters of national boundaries, as we know. So country is often a very important aspect of your multinational transdisciplinary group. Career stage is important, is often a, a very important factor, and we'll talk about that. And of course, gender. Um, and what we want to do is we want to get over this island mentality of insular mentality of looking after one's own skill set, making sure you benefit and demonstrate how wonderful you are, which you need to do for your next promotion round or your next um, tenure application. Sure, in all good faith, but in this sort of circumstance, you've got to get over that possessiveness and lack of trust, build trust and enable you and the team members to share their intellectual property, their knowledge and their skill, skill sets freely. And I mentioned in my title um, that I was going to talk about some experience from the coalface. Um, and there is some, there are some of the coal faces from Australia, France, and the USA um, that I've been involved with uh, grown-ups working together. I've had many years of getting students to work together, but these are grown-ups working together, generally wanting to solve the problem. But of course, you've now got to get them to talk. And in my experience, only uh, and not my, just my experience, my statistical analysis, less than 30% of these group members will have met one another before they come together in this sort of group. Um, for example, down below in this low picture, there is a gentleman called Stuart Pym, who comes from the, um, the Triangle in North Carolina, from Duke University, one of the preeminent scientists of the globe, friend of Thomas Lovejoy, who I mentioned earlier. He's very well known, but not that many people in that group had actually met him, let alone worked with him before. So we've got that sort of um, dynamic and power dynamic. And um, then you've got young people and early career people as well. So it's, um, 
I won't talk particularly about the many stories I have of the silverbacked um, gorillas having uh, competitions with each other and leaving the other members of the group aside. There's some very good stories for over a drink, but I will talk about some of the synthesised information that we've gathered together, particularly Kevin and I. Okay, so bringing countries together. Uh, the, this pie diagram on the top left is the summary of all the groups that um, were brought together in the French Synthesis Centre. And you can see uh, that they've got a fair range and emphasis. Obviously, that was a synthesis centre in France whose aim was to solve these transdisciplinary and, well, not transdisciplinary in that case, interdisciplinary problems. Um, and uh, there's a certain emphasis there. If we look at um, uh, another French group up the top right, you can see uh, there's an emphasis there. It was looking at tropical rainforests in uh, Central Africa. And so the emphasis there is changed, but you've got a very even spread between countries in that group, um, as you can see. Whereas if you turn to a couple of the US, United States of America groups, um, and often this relates to the mandate that's given to the synthesis centre. You've got a lot, a much higher home group of um, USA people. But you've still got in one of those groups a fair swag of different countries. In this case, they were working on this particular group was working on resilience questions. Whereas this group, I won't say what they were working on, but it was not dissimilar to this group. So it's quite interesting what people, um, what people do. Um, just to touch on the group that I'm working with at the moment, the Parsec group is much less ambitious in many ways than, uh, than my uh, Central African Rainforest group. We've only got um, five countries, um, but we have four funders to report to, and there are 30 researchers involved and four languages. And these days, um, I'm not going to talk much about it, but bringing these countries together, um, one of the primary things is the different languages. And uh, we're very privileged in this early part of this century that English tends to be the common language um, and it may not forever be so. So we're busily working on how to deal with multilinguality at the moment which is, I think, a very wise move for us in the future when we're no longer potentially the dominant language. But language is one of the problems. Culture, of course, and I'm talking to Mara here and Lynn, um, cultural differences are really quite profound. Um, and we've had um, standoffs between um, certain countries and certain other countries due to their perceptions and team breakdown. So it's been quite interesting. And the global scope of the project has been ruined by that. So these are not trivial things. The next exercise is, of course, just as untrivial, just as important, which is disciplinary. And this particular example is from a, an Australian synthesis centre group, which was looking at er the error biology as it affected hay fever. Uh, we didn't have um, uh, terribly much this this in, uh, in as far as data went. Um, I actually worked on this for in the early stages of my PhD until I couldn't get funding because it was interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary work, and there was no funding for that in the 1980s. But we, I was took great pleasure in hosting this and facilitating this group to work together and they had representatives from all of those fields in their group and you can't really a respiratory and pediatric physician um, doesn't know how to talk to a meteorologist or necessarily an urban studies person doesn't know how to talk to um, a geospatial well they might know how to talk to a geospatial person but not necessarily to a biochemical and molecular biology person but in this group we had to get them to communicate and they've set up something that is now um, sustainable and sustained. Uh, they've got an online um, allergy system and all that sort of thing. So it's really an allergic risk system. And here we've got an example of some other groups. Um, the one on the bottom right is actually one of the simple, as far as countries involved, um, groups 
Uh, but as far as disciplines involved, is almost as profoundly inclusive and different as that aerobiology group on the left, namely the hydrologists working with ecologists, working with civil engineers. You can imagine the language and the semantic challenges that are related to that. Um, slightly more traditionally, but um, dominated by ecologists is another uh, group from, from Europe. Oh, my apologies. I've um, oh, we, I moved on incidentally, sorry, here we are. As I move on, um, organisations are often very difficult to bring into these groups, particularly groups that are government related. Um, local government tends to be okay, but in Australia, certainly state government is very different and federal government is very different because just think of that little diagram of those people in their islands. Instead of career, um, career requirements that uh, prevent you from sharing your work because you might have it pinched before you've published it, in this case, we found that one of the biggest impediments was, and this goes beyond synthesis groups, was um, government embargoes on free discussion about certain topics. And that can be very difficult. Um, when you're trying to engage in, in learning. This has changed quite a bit and particularly does over um, difficult situations like fire, um, fire prevention and that sort of thing where things become quite critical, uh, but for how long after the emergency has passed. The other difficult group to bring in if you're trying to achieve transdisciplinarity is the private sector. So on the left, we have uh, the history of the Australian Synthesis Centre and the private sector groups had to give up income in order to participate. Uh, we, unless you get funding that pays some sort of sitting fee, which can happen with Indigenous groups very often, there isn't such a thing for a private sector. And when you're thinking about some of these private sector groups that hold enormously important information mining companies, for example, um, uh, maybe the Nature Conservancy even, groups like that which are working on funding agencies time is very much money and the question has to be tremendously important for them to be able to sacrifice some of their uh, researchers in, or people in the case of the private sector but in case of mining company intellectual property at a different level comes in just like the government organizations can sometimes get a bit touchy so um, here we've got a, 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 a series of examples where universities often provide the underpinning because we supposedly have the time and energy to engage in this sort of thing. And finally, bringing career stages together. And this was something that Kevin and I were not able to include uh, due to um, the robustness or not of our sample size, which was only of the 22 groups, but it did come out in the... Um, uh, open-ended responses, which we also included. But um, many people know that uh, from experience, you'll hear what people say. And if you read those four quotes that were unsolicited in response to our survey questions, what was satisfying, what was the thing that made this group work or not work, these comments came up that having an early career researcher in your group, postdoc or early career, was a real winner. Um, if you look at the uh, pie chart on the right, you will see that um, that particular group ha is dominant in senior and mid-career members. No early career and a postdoc. And from the numbers, and that's not always the case with each of these, uh, in this case, I know the group, there was only one postdoc. And that wasn't the only time that has happened. And uh, Glenn was able to participate in a postdoc workshop I, we ran um, in Europe some time ago, where, and I've run a couple since then, where the postdocs really are a court because it is, they're often the dog's body. They're often, as you can see, the people who know R, who can be a really good geek who does GitHub and all this kind of stuff. And they're also the people who help set up the meetings and help be the memory for the group in between meetings and this sort of thing. 
The postdoc is a catch-all for that. And they get quite depressed about this. But on the other hand, they are rubbing shoulders with that wonderful man, Stuart Pym from Duke, who they would normally line up at a conference with 40 others to get a word and to shake a hand. Here they are working on a project with these people. And one of the good outcomes of that particular incorporation of early careers and postdocs is getting a job because you can ask these amazing people, leaders in your field or important people who've contributed, who've got lots of experience as well, to give you a reference as well as your co-learning opportunities. So that's rather sweet. Um, however, if we move on, um, in our analysis, and you might have seen some of this for Kevin, um, there are some inherent negatives. So I mentioned earlier some of these challenges of working across countries, simple as um, I don't really understand the language uh, as well as I might to deal with complex concepts. I can, for example, speak French. Um, I can order coffee. I can have a casual conversation with my friends. However, dealing with complex scientific and often political discussions in these groups can be very can require a much higher level of language comprehension, which immediately cuts someone out of a group. And of course, you've also got a group which um, quite often uh, is insensitive to uh, the other group members who don't speak your home language and people talk in little packs um, uh, about uh, just to cover a point and leave the others out in their little packs in their own language. So it can be challenging and certainly participant satisfaction can be quite diminished um, if you have to, if it's not well managed and you have a lot of countries. Equally well, challenging people across those disciplines. You know, you've got the little group of civil engineers over here and hydrologists, uh, whereas um, the ecologists just don't know what you're talking about. And this diversity of sources, and we measured this by the uh, diversity of sources reported in their publications can really be uh, a negative as far as the uh, participants are concerned. Um, sometimes. Uh, but there are some positives. Uh, and of course, being a female, I thought this was pretty neat. Um, the participant satisfaction and hence adherence to the group goal, to the group and to its goals increased with the proportion of women, women in the group. Now, I hasten to add that the maximum proportion of women in our groups that we surveyed was 66%. So one can envisage that if you got to 100% women, it would be as unsatisfying to group members as 100% male. So um, please don't, uh, don't assume that we think we're, we're promoting that we should have groups that are all women. But a mix, a gender mix, and we only did binary, so you can see we could improve that, but there are there's plenty of literature to talk about the way women function in in groups and in teams that also suggests a different approach. So it isn't just a matter of gender balance, it's a matter of um, approach to problems and to group build group and team building. Um, sorry, but once you get to produce work of value, and this is the bit that really helps, people are much more satisfied if you get lots of publications. So output is really a positive thing for a group. And we'll touch on this later. Um, so this is the diagram, and I must get out of this um, communication and uh, uh, section of my talk very quickly. So I'll only glance on this, or else we'll have no time for anything else. But this is our outcome. And you can see red is negative and blue is positive. Um, so the process, and this is the novel component of our work, the process is, in our case, publishing diversity, the, the diverse behaviour, uh, interdisciplinary behaviour. And there are some real um, take-homes there that we're quite pleased about. Um, however, organisation didn't come out, for example, even though in my experience that's been a very important factor to think about. And different agenda from a government department person than an open-ended science talker from, an academ from academia. And we've come up with some guidelines. 
which again I shall skip over, um, and but highlight a couple of things. Encouraging stage output, I mentioned um, with this publication business. Um, having, and we've practiced this in Parsec, you can't always get a publication as in an article submitted um, early in a group, but to do something together that gets you seen, that gives you a sense of intellectual achievement, um, practical achievement. I've seen the DRAC group has uh, a, very, a couple of very nice web deliveries, for example. Make some capital out of that. Present at a conference. Um, for example, the American Geophysical Union is coming up later this year, and it is a rather good home for your sort of work. Um, but be cautious if you're too, if you really need high impact articles, which of course you do for your promotion. Um, and but if you're too interdisciplinary, it can be a distraction. And uh, we talk a bit about that. And hopefully you'll be able to see the paper quite soon. Um, and of course, give everyone time. So I won't talk on that much more because we must return to the next half of the talk, which is really about finding data and code fit for use. So here you are. It's not just acquiring the data and identifying the tools. It's actually the discipline of making a data management plan. And I'm sure many of you have heard of this, but I'm not sure how much you do it. And it's fairly hard in, in one of these sorts of groups um, to with all these different people with different agendas in their lives to do it. So um, if you have, a, it's a simple thing as you go through your work process. If you have a grant, granting agency you might have a set process, but it's a way to keep track of where you're going to get your data. Have you got any problems acquiring data? Um, and how are you going to manage them? Who's going to hold the data? It's quite important um, to know uh, who's preferably that the data are held somewhere shared within a cup with a couple of people, if not the whole group, because if one person, you know, goes AWOL for some reason um, and the other people can't do their, their model that they want to do, all of a sudden they won't be able to find it. You've got to have some structure to process to, to enable the effective sharing in one of these groups. And of course, deciding on how you'll analyze it. So you're not wasting early on, maybe you will change, you'll say that doesn't work. But also one of the things we've done in Parsec is to keep a, a, a worksheet on Google Drive, or more about Google Drive in a minute. Uh, we keep a workshop, worksheet on Google Drive where we've tried to encourage people to say, well, that data wasn't very good, or this model run wasn't very good, so that we don't try it again, because surprisingly that can often happen. So I've got this rather simple uh, data acquisition exercise on the right um, that I generated from the synthesis groups that we were dealing with uh, and the problems they had in doing their research work and then presenting their paper and, oh, where's the data? How can we do it? Or someone fell, I shouldn't say fell under a bus, but someone fell under a bus in between. And I've put you a link to a more modern one uh, which we've got out of the Parsec group and is available on Zenodo. And I mentioned metadata. When you're trying to find your data, which I promised uh, I'd talk about in the uh, description, um, trying to find your data, you don't actually need to find the actual data first. To actually, You normally discover the metadata, information about the data. And that can tell you whether the data are worth chasing whether emailing that person who has the real data, um, working out how to get it because it's in some strange code. Um, if you've got good metadata, you can save yourself a lot of time. And at the end, of course, you're going to return your information for later. There are standards that you can follow that make things easier. So there's a little suggestion there on the left of some of the ways metadata can be constructed that can make it helpful most helpful. And of course, the latest thing that we talk about now is whether the data are fair. So you won't be able to find any data unless it's got reasonable metadata. Um, and I haven't put in the first reference of this, it's, it's almost unachievable, but initially it seemed 
this sort of idea seemed really um, very difficult to achieve. But this Force 11 group um, has, uh, and a few others have begun to crystallise um, what is involved to make things doable. But you want to find your data. Is it accessible? Can you get at it? Because there might be some um, embargo on it, some protocol involved to uh, prevent you actually being able to get it. It may take you six months to get the data when you've only got two years to do your work. So that's really important. Is it interoperable? Is it in language or code or whatever that you can use? And of course, we all want reproducible, which is where the probity comes in, that your work is able to be reproduced and therefore trustable. I just mentioned there the PID, which everyone uh, talks about, um, and I know there are librarians in your group, so they'll say, oh, yes, we know a PID, that's the DOI. And uh, one of the things that's helping people discover data um, uh, of use is not only metadata, but actually having the data labelled in a way that will, uh, will allow it to be more easily discovered. So the DOI, which most articles have, but increasingly data objects and images are having uh, have this, uh, a pearl for code. For people, the ORCID, we'll talk about this, hopefully everyone here has, uh, on this talk today, has an ORCID ID. And I've put some of these uh, things in my um, biography uh, for a good reason, uh, because don't forget, you might be engaged in transdisciplinary research, but you can improve your, your personal discoverability by having things like ORCID and doing some social uh, communication of your, of your achievements. And of course, you may have an organization or facility, RAW, which is rather fun. So, and physical samples, of course, IGSN. Um, my geologist friends work with that. But okay, so there's a lot to think about, I think about here. And uh, uh, I've thrown in a, another term, the DDOMP, Data and Digital Object Management Plan, which the Belmont Forum, which is our funder for Parsec, it's an aggregation of um, different research agencies in each of those five, four countries that we are working with. Um, it was, it was a, a, a creation of theirs. I don't know that it will have uh, traction, but digital object. So it includes code, it includes images, satellite images, that sort of thing, um, as well as data. So it was an attempt to say a data management plan is not just about that. Okay, so the Parsec team, and this is a little advertisement, I won't talk much about this, but on Zenodo, to make sense of this, so you are not the little duck paddling madly um, under the water, um, that there are a few nice checklists that will help you um, manage your resources and uh, make sure everyone in the team feels evenly empowered, or at least as empowered as they wish to be. So feels is important or wish. And of course, make sure that you don't lose stuff on the way, particularly when you are stealing time from teaching, from whatever else you are doing. It's really great if you can keep track of what you're doing and make sure do uh, always do that inter intermediate publication round. So in Parsec, we've got, uh, we have arrived at a series of tools that we use. We use Google Drive a lot. And don't forget, use of tools is also about willingness of your team members to use the tool. So for example, a couple of people said, right, we're going to use Slack. And I used it, two other people used it. Yeah, this is great. No one else used it, but email and Slack. But, you know, keep it organised, but, you know, it's quite good. So OSF, Open Science Framework, we should be using that. It's, it's freeware um, a little bit. Google Drive, everyone's familiar with Google Drive. Hasn't, isn't as secure as other things, doesn't have the storage, whereas OSF does. AWS, Amazon Web Services, is really good for reproducibility, but it costs. Um, does your university have license? These are one of the things that have meant that I'm not using, or we're not using EndNote, for example. Uh, or another thing that I really liked for a while, we're using Zotero for our references because of proprietary problems. And 
uh, have a little goal. We've made a partnership right early on with, uh, if we're going to engage in open science with the Open Data Initiative, EDI based at the University of Santa Barbara, and um, it's a core trust seal repository. And there's more, software development, GitHub, software preservation, we're popping lots of things in Zenodo. I'm just becoming a Zenodo junkie. We've got, if you look up Zenodo or data sites, you'll find, um, and look at my record, you'll find there's lots of uh, conference publications, reports, checklists that we've been working on. These are intervening material that people can use that isn't necessarily a publication provided by a journal, which is, of course, where most scientists want to be. And we've got our first one out from Parsec just this week on um, the use of Google Street View using machine learning, which is very exciting. Um, and, of course, up-to-date ORCID, which will enable people to, to, to find you. Uh, and um, we've also thought of the acknowledgements very early on. Okay, so there are some tools. Finally, open science practice and outcomes. Now for a bit of fun. So this is about you. So uh, particularly about the individual and remembering individual reward and achievable will, will certainly help the individual participate in a team exercise. And in this instance, these two individuals, and this is a little metaphor taken from uh, um, a, an author of the Victorian times, he actually taught Queen Victoria how to paint at one point, uh, Edward Lear. And he coined this wonderful little story about the owl and the pussycat who went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. And as you will know, talk about disciplinary, organisational and motivational differences between those two animals. So it's certainly uh, not a bad metaphor for many teams, although it's only a two member team. We can imagine more. Um, so open science. First, focus on the researcher. Um, get an ORCID profile, ensure everyone has one. So you need to, and make sure you're activated so you are discoverable. So look at ORCID and make sure everyone has one. I should have done, would have liked to have done a Mentimeter before, beforehand to see how many people had these sorts of things um, and uh, encourage people to get one because it really does make a difference. You become discoverable. Um, when you're using and producing data, make sure you have those licenses to others' data and code. And the experience from my synthesis groups is people often had a mate who gave them their data, and then they find when they're publishing and, oh, you're supposed to publish your data, albeit synthesized or modified, you've got to say where you got some of the original raw data from, and you might have had to get a license. And scrabbling around doing... Um, uh, data sharing agreements at the end of a project is not much fun. So look at Creative Commons. It's a great thing. Um, and, of course, make sure attribution requests. Um, Carol Tenapier in her work had a whole list of them that people tended to want. They want to have a look at the paper before that used your data, you know, before you were allowed to publish and you had to do a big tick. It's easy to forget and provenance note, notes taken. And of course, choose a home for your uh, data and code at the end. But in the interim, make sure it's safe but shared, not a, uh, a mainframe in a lab, not a big supercomputer that no one else can get at in the university. Um, of course, when you do publish your data, describe the data and code using accepted semantic vocabularies. And I'm not going to talk about that today. It's a whole field. But um, think multilinguality, think discipline differences, the same word used three time, in three different ways um, by different uh, people, let alone understanding them. Uh, make sure your vocabulary is at least, would be great if it's uh, community accepted, but if it doesn't exist, you've got, um, it's, it's able, you've got definitions. Rich metadata, think of yourself trying to find your data. If it comes from NOAA, no great problem. But if it comes from anywhere else, it is a problem. My apologies about that. Um, use a rec recognised dialect and include clear licensing statements. And of course, when you publish your data and code, just as you would with your paper, 
get a unique persistent identifier. And if you use a trusted repository, they'll give it to you. So that's not a great drama. And then link it to your ORCID so you get credited for it. At the moment, I have I put in some data with a colleague, Dr. Matthew Bolton, in 19, sorry, 2018. And when I just looked yesterday on data site, our data set, which I thought was probably a bit big and a bit odd, it's the data from Australian of Australian vegetation from 1875 to the to 2000 and to 1995 or something. And it's been cited and used 437 times. So I was very chuffed, um, very, uh, very good, because that if I was wanted to go for a funding round, I could really claim that. So open science. So having all of those things together, if you've got a project like the owl and the pussycat have, um, to get all those things together will really uh, empower you in the open science game. And you can never start too early. So I'd like to thank you very much as I jump through these, screen, these uh, screens a little unexpectedly. Thank you very much for your intention. And um, these are the organisations from whence our 30 people have come, including the funders, the Belmont Forum, the ANR, the French, the Japanese and the Brazilian research agencies um, and the Japanese ones up there somewhere. Um, oh, yes, there's the Japanese research agencies um, uh, have all, all, and there's NSF, have all been involved in this exercise. And I'm not going to sign in to the web. Um, oh, <laughs> apologies for that. And uh, we shall go down for the next. So I should sign into the web. Thank you very much. I shall stop sharing. So I shall have to sign into the web now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Woke up. It's early in the morning. <laughs> Can you still hear me? Yeah. Thank you oh, so good. much for your presentation. <laughs> and uh, from the audience, uh, are there questions for our speaker? <laughs> one, one of the, the things I noticed um, in what you were saying and also in our own experience is that being able to work in one of these teams requires an investment of time up front rather than just launching straight into working on the actual project and then stumbling around because you've got these differences. It's much smarter to spend some time learning more about each other and perhaps about yourself and so that you can then in, be in a better position to move forward. Is that... Uh, Yes, um, yes. <laughs> um, it's actually one of the big challenges in international collaboration at the moment because of COVID. Um, and we are rather fearful that travel will be too expensive anyway. I'm supposed to be going to Colorado in April and it will be. we've only had one face-to-face -face meeting. Um, that sort of social engagement, the time spent, uh, really, out, out of out of working on a on a meeting is terribly uh, on the job, is very very important. And most synthesis centres, all synthesis centres have incorporated some sort of way to do that. At the John Wesley Powell Centre in Colorado, they have push bikes, um, and you ride from your hotel to the um, USGS centre. There, you always have a dinner. Um, some would go to the extent of having a, an expedition in the middle of a meeting. Um, and these are for people who would otherwise not meet physically. They've got to develop that sort of understanding that you've all got this common goal and you've got to have time to have that discussion. Um, that can take years, um, by the way, so I don't want to intimidate you, but, for example, most synthesis centre groups, you've got three or four people who met together over numbers of years and the funding opportunity didn't arise, but they'd be saying, if only we could get these people together, we could really get to tackle this with, you know, the data's on the cusp, we've got enough around, we know there is, we've just got to get those people together. So that discussion often happens and uh, way before you actually get to the meeting. We've managed surprisingly well with Zoom, with certain people in our group and with a certain behaviour. 
So making notes, uh, making sure you write so that people who are speaking a different language can capture that those words and put it in Google Translate very quickly or some other translator. But um, there are certain people who we haven't engaged with well. Uh, I wouldn't say some of the Japanese in our group have struggled. And again, meeting together, they, there's cultural reasons for that as well as language. Some of them are excellent at language, but um, at English. But um, yeah, I think the bonding, I don't know if that answers your question, Glyn, but uh, that sort of peripheral activity is absolutely vital. And, and helpful for planning. Go on a bush walk and you talk and say, oh, but I can't get that stuff. You get free enough to say, oh, you put up, you know, I don't know what you're doing. You're just working in this corner over here on this, pro, on this model. Um, I want to share it more often. You don't say that to someone you don't know very well. So you need the bush walk or the dinner or the tasting whiskey at the whiskey bar or whatever it might be to free you up to actually say that sort of thing that might otherwise be a bit controversial or confrontational. Anyway. Yeah, thanks, Alison. I've got something of a follow-up question to that. Since you talked about um, communication and, you know, the, the language differences and the cultural differences, certainly, and the, 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 those will absolutely come into play and have an effect. I'm wondering if you could talk about how t a group can integrate in a way that allows its members to start thinking like each other. I mean, we've got in our group engineers, we've got sociologists, we've got an economist, we, you know, um, a business economist, and we don't, we don't all think like each other. Uh, from our disciplinary perspectives, we can explain a term to each other. We we can bridge aspects of language and communication but that's related to but different from learning how to think like each other uh, and you know we don't have to all become intellectual experts in each other's arenas but and understanding how, how to you know think from a process oriented perspective with a goal outcome versus someone coming from that perspective learning to think in a way that um adds more uh, cultural meat and potatoes to what you're discussing instead of zooming straight to the outcome. Uh, yeah. We've all found that a, a unique challenge that we probably could have anticipated but weren't necessarily anticipating. I wonder if you could speak about that. Actually, that's, that's really important. I, I touched on that with the disciplines, I suppose, and skill sets. Um, we, we often got discipline and skill set put together. Um, I think one of the things, I don't know that you ever do get someone to think like you. Uh, <laughs> so you've got to take a pleasure in that and consider it a joy and a delight that you actually share this space with someone who thinks so completely differently. And if you think of the Venn diagram, it's that little overlap that you can develop. Um, so it's an attitudinal thing as much as anything else and a sense of respect for the other person and the, the value of the way that other person thinks because, um, yeah, they, they, an ecologist really, you know, who rambles, I, I know none of you are, but I did have a little series of graphics about ecologists who like being gung-ho and rushing out into the bush and catching crocodiles and, uh, or alligators and climbing up trees and, getting excited about a tiny little um, bit of moss or something somewhere um, is just totally foreign to someone who's sitting at a computer all day, um, you know, doing code and being excellent at it. So a sense of respect and some, again, uh, it's almost touching back to what Glyn's talking about, some time spent to get to know, to keep that common goal in front of the, the team that the common goal is there, but also to have those outcomes. So what we've done, and I think it's worked very well in one side, in Parsec, in, to some extent, it's been easier to do on the data side than it has been on the synthesis side, which is doing the uh, machine learning of, um, well, the satellite imagery using satellite or remote sensing to detect the socioeconomic indicators. 
Uh, it's been difficult to get the data. It's held us up most dreadfully of the right scale and all that sort of thing. With the data side, having all this output along the way that different groups of people in combinations have contributed to has really helped with getting that uh, trust and respect between each other. So I would throw in a couple of uh, conference sessions, posters, um, uh, checklists of how-tos maybe about the common problem into the mix, and I think that will greatly improve um, that uh, collaboration ability between the two, uh, well, between different, different fields. And, yeah, I totally understand where you're coming from, totally. Um, I'm watching the time, so I must let... Uh, someone else say something if they would like or I do have a question uh, so you mentioned about some of the challenges and you also talked about providing some insights that you have learned uh, about these interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary themes my question is about the frequency uh, of doing common brainstorming over a subset of the problem or, or the larger problem how do, what would be your recommendation on the frequency of such interactions at, over the period of years you are developing at transdisciplinary? Yes, I don't know what your time horizon is uh, for DRAC. I didn't pick that one up. However, yes, that is actually really pertinent, actually, because, yes, you do, you walk away and you forget. And that was one of the roles of the postdoc was to be a rememberer for the group, be a needler. And that's a bit unfair. But the, I suppose the, as far as face-to-face -face meetings went in the international group, every six months was absolutely, well, was really vital if you could manage it. And we did that with Data One as well, um, who's another subject of our study. So every six months to face-to-face. -to -face. Of course, we haven't been able to do that. What has worked with uh, one of the strands of Parsec is every two weeks we have a get-together. We have a Zoom get together, we have an agenda, we have a rolling agenda, we have a folder in Google Drive full of this stuff, we have links to submissions, we've got a submission to the Japanese, oh, yesterday I put in a submission to the Japanese um, Geolog Geological Union Conference, um, we're getting another one in today for Sustainability Research Innovation Conference, and there'll be little buds with different cohorts of people, as I, I mentioned to Aaron. Um, but, yeah, fortnightly keeps that rolling. It's not everyone goes, but it, it does keep it rolling and people feel as though they're missing out if they don't go. Even though there are notes that we, we do, sometimes we record, particularly if there's a presentation of how we did this and we do record the meetings and we put them up um, uh, often maybe in, in, in YouTube, but it's private too. It's as a working environment. You don't have to put everything on YouTube. Um, but we'll have an MP4 or something, and we'll pop a link to that on, on our private YouTube. So, so that's quite important. So with the synthesis centres, with the six months once when we had face-to-face, -face, um, we'd give them things like wikis and communication tools to enable them and zoom has just come along and other things in leaps and bounds so the options are good but i suggest fortnightly helps we've had two monthly on the other side because people are too busy doing their stuff and that's barely enough because you have too much forgetting in between of certain people and you repeat stuff and that you don't grow and that's that's unfortunate So keep the missing out, a missing out factor. Think of that child who wouldn't go to bed because mum and dad were having a party in their house and you'd creep down the stairs and you'd, you'd hide behind the couch because you felt you were missing out. If you can develop that in your team, then you're doing well. <laughs> so there you are. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other questions for our speaker? Yeah, I um, just had one more. Um... When we were forming this project initially, I was really, really excited to have our library people with us. And we've got Nathan and Aaron, and I think Megan must have had to leave, but uh, my one of the reasons for being excited about having library, the library faculty involved is that, I mean, I 
previous projects, they've been very, very helpful in with bibliography searches, that, but, but also with finding data in different data sources and databases. And, and so when you were talking about the data management plan, I was thinking maybe the people in the university, I would assume, might be in the best position to construct such a thing or to help faculty who don't know much about it to operate a, or develop and operate a data management plan would come from the library. Uh, is that your experience in other places? Yes. Um, first thing, uh, one of uh, Kevin and my, well, how we met was through something called Data One. And that was really uh, spearheaded uh, by e-research librarians, which was fantastic. Um, and certainly, I, the, the, certainly in Australia, uh, the, in the university system, the librarians, we call them e-research librarians, have really um, taken off. Um, and it's been tremendous to see because eight years ago, Carol Tenapier from then Tennessee uh, University, um, great librarian, came to Australia and I said, oh, we don't have librarians like you here. And she said, well, we don't have many in America either. Don't believe that, you know, the little slice I was seeing in Data One was a representative, but um, the Australians really have taken it on. And so, yes, they are helping with data management plans. They are helping as they always did with data searching. Of course, a lot of that has become independent too. So you, anyone can go and do a systematic review if you wish as long as you have the discipline, but you don't necessarily have the time. Um, and as you say, uh, some of the PIDs, that idea of these digital identifiers, that's librarians, you know, meat and bread and meat, shall we say. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Um, very, very useful. Things like uh, Zotero, Zenodo, that's open source stuff, but it's still fundamentally sharing information, which is the grist for a librarian. So yeah, I think you're, you're right. They can be very useful and important attribute. I must say not many synthesis teams, I can say, had them, but Data One did and continues to, and it's, um, it's really made a tremendous difference. So, yay, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Hi, no. uh, random note, I will say the librarians at Monash University and La Trobe University, I have found very talented and very good at what they oh. do. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to introduce you to some at uh, Queensland University. because I would love uh, to meet them. Uh, there's also the Australian Research Data Consortium, which is really heavy hitting internationally. And I'm not just being a fan because I come from Australia at the moment, but that that is integrated um, with digital discovery in a way that doesn't happen in any other country to my knowledge. So it's, it's a, yeah, there's, there's um, you can harness your power, Aaron. Uh, I think Mara had a question, is that right? Oh, it's a different question. Are you coming to Colorado? Did I understand that well? If I can, I will come to Colorado. And when I say if I can, um, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's other things involved, not just COVID, but um, our borders are now open. But for institutional travel, uh, it is a, still a little bit questionable because insurance isn't as you paid, whereas Glynn moving privately, that's okay now. <laughs> in any yeah. case, if you are in Colorado, plan some time for Richita. We would love yes. to have you here. I'd love to see you all, yes. And, yeah. and do, some, do some things together. We had promised that a long time ago. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I, um, Mara and I met, oh, I think it was 2004 or something, and um, we discussed something about women, and I hope that uh, <laughs> you were impressed by that graph that I didn't. The data are true. They are not fiddled with. The, we can share, well, I can't actually share the data because that's people's identities and we're not allowed to do that. So I can't actually share the data to say it's true. But uh, that particular data set, we're sharing, oh, Aaron, one of the things that Kevin and I did, or me particularly, because I gathered it manually rather than using R or Python or something, which was what my, one of my friends did, um, was do, a bibli do the bibli bibliographic analysis, which nearly killed me. 
um, literally, and found, yes, so having standardised vocabularies to compare publications and people and, you know, for their disciplinary uh, field contributions was, uh, you know, was very interesting, particularly given you had to encapsulate keywords for a journal down to one or two in order to do a cross analysis. So, yeah, having an, a librarian around would have been really helpful. <laughs> so, I think we've almost stayed. Everyone's uh, welcome. Actually, people have had to go to class, and my apologies about sneezing. It's early in the morning, and yeah, but anyway, <laughs> just a little sneeze. It isn't COVID. I have been. <laughs> uh, thanks for sh uh, sharing your time with us so early on in the day. It seems like somebody has a comment or question. Was there a comment or question from the audience? Okay, if there are not, then uh, I want to thank our speaker, Dr. Speck. Uh, for being available so early in the day and doing this presentation. It has been very helpful, learned a lot uh, about uh, transdisciplinary themes. So I wish, uh, Dr. Speck, you have a good weekend. Thank you very much. And I will share my, uh, I'll send my PowerPoint to you. That, so that, that, because great. there are links in there that I think might be useful anyway. Okay. When it is right. uploaded to YouTube, I will share the link with you as well. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Never mind. I can see all my, all my habits. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And lovely to see some of you again. Nice to see you, Holger and Mara thank and Glyn. And thank you. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy your time. Thank you. You can go back and, and sleep in a bit. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.